title this morning of the sermon is The Valley of Achor. The Valley of Achor. Now it says there in Joshua chapter 7, verse 25, And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. So this is quite the scene taking place here. This man, uh, Achan, has, has transgressed the commandment of God. He's gone against the Lord and his will. And, you know, God's not pulling any punches here. I mean, when you're, when you're dragging people out, not just himself, but all that he has, wives, children. And, you know, I don't want to go into to set the scene for you uh, this morning, but go ahead and think about that situation. When you have this man's family in front of you, and then you proceed to stone them in, 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 in accordance with God's will. So God's not messing around here. And it says there that when they were done doing this, that they not only, it wasn't enough that they stoned them, that then they proceeded to burn everything with fire. And then not only that, they actually piled rocks upon it. And what was the purpose of that? To be a memorial. If you recall just a few chapters earlier, when they crossed over Jordan, he told them to every man to take a stone, 12 stones, one for each tribe of Israel, and to set it up as a memorial forever. So God sets up memorials in the Bible of good things and also bad things. Things that are going to encourage us, but also things that are there to warn us. And here, he, not, he piles up these rocks, and they actually give a name to that valley. And the name of that valley is the Valley of Achor, which is just another na word name for Achan, unto this day. That's the name of it. And what I want to kind of get through tonight, or this morning rather, is the fact that we see this man Achan, he, he sins a sin, and what he ends up doing is destroying his entire family. Okay? And, what I, and this is probably something I could have preached on Father's Day, but I feel like this is something that needs to get preached again, that this is something that men and everybody really could apply to their lives, but especially men, especially men who will have families, they need to get this message. Because I've seen this in churches where men just you know, destroy their families. Now, I'm not saying to the point where there's no recovering. Now, for Achan here, there was no recovering that. I mean, what's done is done. You're getting stoned. You're getting burned. You're going to be an example throughout all generations uh, that, of, of, what, of what you did wrong. Of course, men can you know, mess up in their lives. They can hurt their families, and they can move on and go elsewhere and recover. But we should still, you know, why do we want to go through that process? Why don't we just go ahead and take note of this, this message here in the Bible, this warning, and spare ourselves and our families the suffering, Okay. Men can destroy their families through their actions alone. Now, people will say, well, why did they burn the kids? And why did they stone the kids and the wife? They didn't steal anything. And then they'll, so people will object to that. So then people want to, you know, backtrack and say, oh, well, you know, it was in the midst of his tent, so his family knew it. You know, but, and, and it, the Bible doesn't, but the Bible doesn't explicitly say that. You can, can you know, can, you can uh, make conjecture. You could infer that if you want, that because it was intense, they knew that. I don't know that they did. But I think what's going on here is God is showing us, giving us a very clear example that when a man sins and that when a man who has a family messes up, he can destroy his whole family through his actions alone. I preached last on Father's Day about how, how we that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. Look, if we fail to do that as men, you know, they're going to suffer. And I don't want to re-preach that. Re -preach that. And, here's the, and you say, why is it? Why is the wife and everybody else going along with it? getting punished right along with, these, with the man. How is it that a man could do so much harm to a family himself through his own actions? Because of the fact that wives are to be subject to their husbands. And that's not popular. You know, I, and I'd like to say it's only not popular in the world, but unfortunately, even today in Baptist churches, it's not even popular in a lot of Baptist churches. Where a lot of women, if a pastor gets up and says, hey, wives are to be subject under their own husbands. <coughs> no, I'm not, I don't like that. Well, tough. That's what the Bible says. You could take it up with God. The Bible's real clear about this. Keep something in Joshua. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 3. I mean, if you've ever gotten as far as Ch Genesis chapter 3 in your Bible reading, you would know this. It's part of the curse. You know, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, you're going to 1 Peter 3, Under the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. That's part of the curse that God has put upon woman, is that she is to be subject to her husband. And he shall what? Rule with thee? Rule alongside thee? Be a partner? No, it says, and he shall rule over thee. Not because he's better, not because, but because that's what God has ordained. That women are to be subject to their own husbands. 
This is the order of authority that God has given. And the reason why I'm preaching is this is because men need to understand that a great responsibility has been put upon us to lead our homes. That it, we don't need to go ahead and make it even more of a curse for women by being bad leaders. If God has given us that authority, let's use it well. And let's guide and let's lead and do what's right. And this is the authority that God has given. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the world, they may also without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. We could stand to probably read several of these verses, but let's go ahead and jump down to verse 5. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, you know, godly women who loved the Lord, did what? Or do, uh, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. You know, a godly woman who loves the Lord and knows the scripture is going to be, wi will willingly submit and take this role upon herself. And the women that bucket this and have a problem with it, don't, I don't care how nice they dress. I don't care how godly they talk. I don't care what kind of facade they put up for everybody to see. If they don't agree with this, they're not right with God, period. Because that's what the Bible says. Even, verse 6, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any, amaze, any, any amazement. So this is not optional in the scripture. This is not optional for ladies, for wives that want to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. As far as God's concerned, this isn't something you can take or leave. It says wives must submit to put themselves in subjection to their own husbands. And that puts a huge responsibility on the husband and as I mentioned, you know, in my Father's Day sermon, we, gotta, we live in a world today that just wants to make husband look like a bunch of Homer Simpsons, like a bunch of doofuses. But what men need to understand today is that you are, God has given you authority in your home to lead that home. A huge responsibility has been put upon us. We must lead. We must take charge of our homes. We must make sure our wives are in subjection. <clears throat> if you would, we'll continue on in 1 Peter it says in verse 7, Likewise ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Dwell with them according to, how about this, knowing, you know, uh, knowing that this is the, the case, that these are the facts. Why don't we dwell with our wives according to this knowledge? That we're in charge, that they're in subjection, that they're looking for us to be the leaders that we should be. You know, and it, it's, here's something I just want to kind of say, just put this out there for people to think about. This was brought to my attention. I was reminded of this, and it's very true. You know, when you, when you have a woman or a wife that gets out of sorts, and she, kinda, she starts to kind of you know, wear the proverbial pants in her family, and she's kind of the one that's in charge, you know, it's real easy to just fault her. You know, and she's wrong, okay? But here's, here's what happens. You can see this in society. You know, <coughs> Chaz, you know, when there's a vacuum, like up in Seattle, where they, you know, kicked all the powers that be out, it took over, you, there, when there's a vacuum in power and leadership, bad leadership moves in. Some, it's a vacuum. You know why they call it a vacuum? Because when what's supposed to be isn't there, it sucks something else into its place, good or bad. And so when a wife you know, doesn't have the leader that she needs, she's just by nature going to start leading. She's just by nature going to start doing what she needs to do. And if the pu husband's just this kind of laid back, easy going, not really going to cause a ruckus, not going to really take charge of things, she will. And then it'll turn in, and then, then at best what they'll do is just say, well, it's a partnership. We're just, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're co-leaders. Wrong. That's not biblical. That's wrong. So that's why men, husbands, need to stand up and be strong leaders, lead their homes firmly, and, 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 and lay down the law and make it known in that house that we are in charge and nobody else. And not just say, hey, I'm in charge and beat my chest and walk out the door, but actually be in charge and then take charge. Watch over our house, protect our house, lead our house. <clears throat> Husbands make or break their families spiritually. Husbands make or break their families. It's not all in the wife. I mean, obviously mothers have a huge role to play in the spiritual development of their children, yes. But it's up to the father to, to oversee that, to provide that, so that she can even have that ability to do that or the opportunity to do that. Husbands will make or break their families spiritually. 
You know, I and it, and you know, I'm I'm kind of at to the point now with this church where I'm kind of ready to just kind of let you know a little bit about more who I am personally. I try not to bring up a lot of things from my own past, but I'll share this with you: is that I understand the devastating effects of a, of a family that doesn't have a father, and w when there is no spiritual guidance there. And let me tell you something: it has had devastating effects on my family. I mean, my dad left home when I was seven years old, just took off one day after being just a you know drinking coke selling wife smacking husband is what he was and you know I forgive him I love him you know I don't mean to bring shame upon him but that's what he was okay and to this day you know I'm thank God that I was able to recover myself you know but still deal with it but my siblings my you know one of my siblings has a sodomite for a son you know who I blame for that in some part my father for not being the spiritual leaner that he needed to be. And I'm only bringing this up to try to drive this home because that's a real world of example. Because sometimes a preacher can get up and preach all this and we just kind of go, oh yeah, that's true. But when you start to hear things that are real, that actually happen, you have to see it flesh out in people's lives, then it becomes real. And then maybe we'll sit up a little straighter and take our job as husbands a little more seriously. Husbands can break or make their family spiritually. That's what Achan did. Achan looked, saw all that, was tempted. He could have said, whoa, that, if I do that, there's going to be consequences. So how, what are different ways that a husband can just destroy his family? Okay. Well, how about this? Husband's, a husband's covetousness and greed. In the case of Achan, go back to Joshua. Keep something in Joshua all morning until we're done. In the case of Joshua, or excuse me, in the case of Achan, that's what it was. He saw the garment, he saw the gold, he saw the silver, and he got so covetous for worldly possessions that he went ahead and went against the, the will of God. He disobeyed the commandment of the Lord, and he suffered, and then his family suffered right along with him. Because he was clearly warned. They said, all, all the spoil belongs unto the Lord. And it wasn't like God wanted all the spoil to himself. He said, just that first city. And then everything else was theirs. But, you know, Achan just couldn't wait. He had to have it right now. And he got greedy and he got covetous. And he says in verse 19 of Joshua 7, And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the God of it, Lord God of Israel, and make confession to him, and tell me now what thou hast done, and hide it not from me. And Achan answered to Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among, and I'll give Achan some credit, at least he's got enough, you know, he's got enough guts to fess up to what he's done wrong. At least he's man enough to own up when he's done something wrong. <laughs> Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a Babylonian garment, the two shekels of silver, hundred shekels of silver, a wedge of gold, and fish, fifty shekels of weight, then I coveted and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and I, and the silver's under it. You know, he saw them, right? He saw among the spoils. The lust of the eyes led him into this sin. He saw them. Then I coveted. You know what we need to do as men to make sure we don't destroy our homes over things like covetousness and greed is to keep our eyes on what matters most. Focus our eyes on our families, on our wives, on our children, and keep our eyes on what matters the most. Look, there's nothing more valuable in your life as a husband if, if, you're, on, if, you, if, you have, if you're a normal human being. <laughs> if you're a person who has actual normal, regular affection for, for, for your family, they're the most important thing to you. What price are you going to put on your family? A Babylonian garment? Some gold? Some silver? Is that the price that we're willing to put on our children? Just another, you know, just another 20 hours at work this week. Just another 10. And I get it. Sometimes dad's got to do what get dad's got to do. But when dad's doing that, when he doesn't need to do it, we saying he's just making money for making money's sake and sacrificing time with his family, not being there with his family like he needs to be, just so he can make more money and have more things, have some more garments from Babylon, his eyes are on the wrong place. And he needs to adjust his focus and, and get his eyes on what matters the most. Otherwise, you're going to destroy your family. And that's what that would look like today, I think, where we just put work before our family. And work's important. I'm not saying it's not. I'm not saying let's all go on welfare and just hang out with mom and, mom and the kids all day. We'll drive each other nuts, right? 
It's good for the man to go out and earn, you know, he's got to go out and earn, bring home the bacon, work by the sweat of his face. He shall eat bread, the Bible says. That's his part. But a lot of guys today, they get so wrapped up in work, they get so wrapped up in just chasing after things and stuff that they just totally neglect their family. Or they get caught up in hobbies. How about that? They get caught up in other people's kids through all their hobbies. You know, through the bowling league or the, 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 the football team or the baseball team or coaching this or coaching that. You gotta make, that's fine to do that, but you better make sure your eyes are where they belong, on your family. And let me say this. If something comes up and, and you have to deal with something, there's nothing you shouldn't be willing to just drop and take care of business with your family. And, and let me say this. This is something I meant to say th Thursday night as well. If my kids ever step out of line, I want to know about it. And not so that I can chew you out, so I can chew them out. And I know it's hard to come to somebody. That, it's hard to go to a parent, period, and tell them there's something wrong with their kids. Anyone that has to, has to say, oh, there's something wrong, you know, your kid's acting up, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're in the back just, you know, taking the Gatorade bottles and just throw them over the wall. You know, whatever. And that's not even that. You know, maybe they're running around when they shouldn't be, they're... Just, just being, doing what kids do. You know, foolishness is bound to the heart of the child. Everybody's kid is going to act up and do something stupid. Okay, no one's perfect. But is we should be able to go to another parent and say, "Hey, there's a problem here. Can you deal with this?" And if somebody comes to you as a parent and says, "Hey, you have an issue with this child," just let you know. Don't get mad at that person. Deal with it. And so I know it's hard just to go to, you know, a parent as is. I know it's even harder to go to a, a parent when that parent is the pastor or the deacon. Because for whatever, I get it. I've, I've had to do that. It's hard. But you know what? The pastor and this deacon right here want to know if their kids step out of line. Please, I won't be mad. Even if you're wrong. Even if you come to me and tell me something about my kid and I go talk to him and it turns out you are just being some petty person. You know, they, they, I saw, I looked up there, they were picking their nose during your sermon. I'll still thank you. I'll still say, thanks for letting me know. But, and I, that'll be it. I won't jump down your throat and be like, what, like you never picked your nose? I saw you last week picking your nose during the... No, I'm just kidding. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to jump, even if you're wrong, even if I think it's petty, I'm not going to be mad. I'll just thank you. Thank you for doing that because I want to be open like that. But let me say this. If I come to you and say, hey, you've got a problem here and you need to deal with it, there should be nothing Nothing that, sta that gets in the way of you dealing with it. Not this attitude of, well, we'll get to it. <laughs> Your eyes are on the wrong place. Well, I'm busy right now. Drop whatever you're doing and deal with your children. And the more severe it is, the more, the more quick, quickly you should be dropping whatever's got your attention and dealing with it. As a man, as a father, that's our job. That's our role. To lead our families. And not to let... You know, these lusts of other things, the way we spend our time, our covetousness, whatever, get in the way of doing that. What's another way husbands destroy their families like Achan did? Go over to, keep something in Joshua again, but go over to Acts chapter 4. How about a husband's desire for vainglory? You know, he just wants to get some reputation, so he's just going to invest his time or step on some heads or do whatever it takes to get this reputation that he wants. Misplaced ambition will destroy your family. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Talking about the early church, it says in Acts 4, 32, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any man of them that, uh, uh, that ha said of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the prices of these things, uh, to, to, of the things that were sold. And they laid, down, laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who was by the apostles, was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite of the country, and of the country of Cyprus, Having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And you know what I love about Barnabas is he did it out of, that, out of the goodness of his own heart. He just wanted to do it. No one compelled him to do that. He didn't ask for it, you know, and make sure you name this pew after me, put a plaque on the wall and, and so everybody knows how much I gave. 
He just did it because he wanted to be a blessing. Because he saw that God was moving, that God was working, that God was doing something, and he just wanted to further the work of God, not to get a name for himself. And you know what? The, the irony is he kind of got a name, didn't he? They surname him. They say, and then the Bible saying, hey, he was a Levite, and he was the country of Cyprus. And the Bible, God even here wants you to know who this was. But do you think that guy was looking for it? Just, you know, just, just going out looking for some, to get some vain glory? Maybe if I sell everything and give it, my name will be in Scripture. Maybe, the, maybe I'll get a surname. Maybe the apostles will recognize me. Maybe people will know who I am. <clears throat> Go on in verse five or chapter 5, verse 1. You'll see the exact opposite. But a certain man, Ananias and Sapphira, with his wife, sold a possession and kept back the part of the price. So they're, they're, they're selling it, but then they're keeping a little bit of money, which is fine. They could do that. No one's saying, you got, no one's saying give us everything or nothing. They're, everyone's just doing this out of the goodness of their own heart. But these two, they sold it uh, and, and kept back the part of the price, his wife being privy to it, meaning she knew about it, she was in on it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. You see, these folks, they didn't want to be outdone by Joseph and Barnabas. Right? The, the, or, or, oh, excuse me, Joseph, who is Barnabas. They didn't want to be outdone by him. They see what he's doing. They're like, oh, well, we should get a surname. Oh, we, we, we want to get in on this and get some vain glory for ourselves. <clears throat> and it says, verse 3, But Peter and, uh, said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price thereof, of the land? So they bring it and they say, here's, here's, here's the price of the land. We're giving it to you guys. But they've got part of it. But they're saying this is, this is all it was worth. So they're lying under the Holy Ghost. Saying, oh, we gave so much, but they didn't give so much. Well, they could have just come up and said, hey, we sold this land. We're going to keep this much for ourselves. But you guys, here, please take the rest. That would have been fine. But they're saying, no, we're giving everything. We're just, we're just laying it all at the apostles' feet. We're just making such a huge sacrifice. We're just with you 100%. We're just all the way in. But what, they're really, what it really is, they don't want to be outdone. And when Peter calls them out, and he says, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Now, when he says, has Satan filled thine heart, I don't, I don't necessarily believe that means that Satan literally filled his heart like Judas entered, or Satan entered a Judas. I think he, it's kind of a figure of speech just to express how wicked they were. You know, maybe Satan really did fill his heart. The Bible doesn't expressly say that. This is just Peter saying, hey, why has Satan filled your heart? You know, why are you wicked? Why are you evil? Why are you lying on the Holy Ghost? Why are you trying to make yourself out to be something you're not? Because, because you're just, because of your blind ambition. Because you're more concerned about getting a reputation and being known than you are about protecting your family. <clears throat> you know, it shows the, the real nature of their motives, right? The vain glory to be seen as something they aren't. And you know the rest of the story, if you've read it. He falls down dead. They go out and bury him. His wife, Sapphira, comes in. He says, did you sell the land for so much? She says, yes, yeah, for so much. He's, you know, so behold, those that buried your husband are at the door and they shall even bury you with them. And she falls down dead. And great fear comes upon all people. And just like that, out of vain, the desire for vainglory, just to earn some reputation, just to be known as somebody, just to be some big shot, Ananias destroys his wife, kills her, gets himself destroyed permanently, no recovering from that. And he's just wiped out. Men can destroy their families for their vain desire for vainglory. And I've seen this in churches where guys just want to be somebody and then they get called out. You know, they've been just these conniving, little backstabbing, uh, you know, people. That, and, and, when they, and then what's the worst part is when they finally get called out and thrown out and their kids are just wailing, they just want to sit there and make their kids suffer through that. I've seen that. People are told, hey, you need to get out. You need to leave right now. They're, it, they're called out in front of everybody. You know how embarrassing that is? It's, it's embarrassing. And the kids are just devastated. And he's just gonna, they're just going to sit there and just make their kids suffer through that. And what's even worse is when they try after that, they want to come back again. Well, let's, try, let's do that all again. Let me drag my kids back to this place where this traumatic experience took place. So that, just so everyone knows that I'm right with God again. Look, whether, if I got kicked out justly or unjustly, you know what I'd do? I'd move on immediately to spare my family suffering. I'd just go find another church. And go serve God there. Because you can serve God in other churches. I don't know if everybody realizes that this morning. This isn't the only church that you can serve God in. And if somebody in this room wants to go serve God in another church, I'm all for it. Because it can be done. 
And you know, people can go out and have successful Christian lives in other churches. There's families in here that have done it. I did it for 11 years before I even heard of Pastor Stephen Anderson. I managed somehow to serve God faithfully for 11 years without Pastor Anderson in an old IFB church. And everybody here in this room can do it. If you have the same Holy Ghost that I have, if you have the same King James Bible that I have, and you say I have the same humble spirit that's in it for the right motives, you could serve God anywhere. And that's a whole other sermon right there. They're desiring to be something they're not. You can destroy them. And you know, it's funny that he says, why has Satan filled my heart? Go over to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Because of his pride. That's the sin of Satan, his pride, right? Want to be made into something they're not. Want to be perceived as something they're not. Or maybe they just covet some, somebody else's position. Maybe they, maybe they want to be the pastor. Maybe they think they do a better job. And they're not, they know they're never going to get it. So maybe the best thing to do is just try to take the pastor down a notch. Well, if I could just make him look bad, then I'll feel better about myself. You say, I thought only kids work like that. No, my friend, some people never grow up. They carry that right into adulthood. They try to bring, oh, they, they feel like they have some, it's just the strangest thing when I see people just, they, they put this, they have this image of what the pastor is or what the pastor's wife is. They lift them up on a pedestal and then they begin to compare themselves to this image of them that they've created in their own mind. In their own mind, they've created this image. And they begin to compare themselves and they feel like they come up short. Like they're, they're inferior somehow. So then they have to, it's so weird, and then they have to start to bring them down. And it's all based upon some you know, idea of what they are in their head. You follow what I'm saying? They lift them up and they say, oh, they, they've got it all together. They're perfect. They're so much better than me. And I just feel like I can never be like they are. So I'm just going to start attacking them. I'm going to start just trying to bring them down a notch to make me feel better about myself. I'm telling you, this happens. It's out there. I've seen it. And it's just like the devil. That's why, that's why he's saying, why has Satan filled thine heart? Why are you trying to make yourself into something you're not, Ananias? Because you're like the devil, because you're full of pride. You're like the devil who said, I will be like the Most High. I might not be able to be him, but I'm going to make myself like him. And if it means I have to bring him down to make him more like me, that's what I'm going to do. Look at Matthew chapter 23, verse 1. He says, Then Jesus spake to the multitude and his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All whatsoever they bid thee observe, you observe, that observe and do. But do not after their works, for they, do not, they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move one of them with their fingers. And why is it? But all their works they do for to be seen of men. Look, some people get in the ministry, they, get in the, they look for positions, they desire to be exalted and lifted up for one reason only, to be seen of men. That's it. That's the only reason they're in it. And those are the worst kind of people. Look, we need preachers. We need pastors all over this country. But you know who I don't want in it? People who absolutely must be pa pastors. You know who usually the best people are that are, are fit for the ministry? People who have to be drug into it, kicking and screaming. People who at the end of the day would rather just do something else. Like Moses. Remember all Moses' excuses? When God said, hey, you're going to lead my people. Oh, blah, 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 I can't talk. I'm a stutterer. Oh, send Aaron. Right? People that are just drug into it are usually do the best job at it because they're in it for the right reasons. Not to be seen of men, to be lauded and praised. <coughs> I'm going to move on to my... Uh, let me just move on to my next point here. A proud husband... Is another person who will destroy his husband is a proud husband. And, and, and he, he will despise the man of God. Let me just, let me just I got to just start this whole point over. A proud husband who despises the man of God will destroy his family. What kind of men destroy their families today? What kind of men are like Achan? Men who are covetous and greedy. Men who have, don't have their eyes where they belong on their own family who are more caught up in other things of this world in their own family. Men who uh, will, will put their own reputation and their own desire for vainglory above their family are Achans, and they're going to destroy their family. And it's sad because they don't have to be that way. That's the worst part about it. If they just eat some humble pie and shut up and just do what's right, 
They could, they didn't, you know, Achan didn't have to destroy his family. No one put a gun to his head and say, pick up that Babylonian garment. He said, I saw it, I coveted, I sinned. How about a proud, a, and what all leads to the fact, and it's all pride at the end of the day. The lust of the eyes, the pride of life. A proud husband who despises the man of God will destroy his family. Go over to Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16. You know, people, people who get bent out of shape against the pastor and then will just sit there for years just harboring this animosity. This happens more, than you, more often than you think. The pastor preaches something or comes to them privately and rebukes them or, you know, he maybe even rebukes them publicly if need be. And then they, and it seems like, oh, they took it. And they, and they say, oh, I'm sorry, I took it. But in, inside, they haven't gotten it right. Inside, they're just festering. And then when an opportunity comes along for them to just jump all over him, they're all, they'll, they'll take it. <clears throat> but I'm going to say this right now. This proud husband who can't just swallow his pride and take the rebuke and get it right and move on with his life, that guy's going to destroy his family. He's going to take everybody down with him just like Achan. So what, that's what we see in Numbers chapter 16. Look at verse 1. Now Korah, the son of I I Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan, and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. So here you got guys who've got that reputation. They've got, they're somebody, right? They're men of renown. They're famous. That doesn't mean they have the paparazzi following them, right? It means that, you know, people know who they are, their name. And let me just say this. When bad people are given the spotlight, they just want more of it. When bad people get a little, they get a little bit of the spotlight, they get behind from the pulpit, they guess, preach. The, if the wrong person gets that, they, it's going to go to their head and it's going to destroy them because then they're just going to want more of it. And, and why do they want more of it? To be seen of men, not to edify the body, not to, not to you know, lift God up in, in song and praise, but to just be seen of men. How great I am up here in this pulpit. Oh, look how good I look up here. It's all about them. Oh, my sermon was so wonderful. Look at all the views I have on YouTube. Look how everybody's sharing my hot sermon. And look, I'm all for sharing the hot sermon. I love the hard preaching. But you know what? There's a whole lot more to life than just ripping on fags and Jews all the time. A lot more important things that need to get preached. Because without these things, you know, we won't grow as Christians. <clears throat> and when bad people like this guy Korah are given the spotlight, when they're famous and known and they're renowned, it destroys them because all they want is more of it. And they despise the man of God. They want, they're like, well, this is so nice. Man, I, I like this guest preaching. I could get used to this. Everybody looking at me, everybody amen in my sermon. Oh, this is nice. Man, I could do this full time. I sure would like to pastor this congregation. Let me see if I can get, do something to that pastor and get rid of him. Make him look bad. Lift myself up. This happens. Look at verse 3. And they gather themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation who are holy, every one of them. And the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. Now did Moses lift up himself above the congregation? Was it Moses that exalted himself? Did he see a help wanted ad? in the paper of, of the backside of the desert in Midian? Did he wander into Laban's living room one day and see the help wanted ad? Or not Laban, what was his, what was his oh, I'm forgetting now. Jethro, I got it. <laughs> I had to think of the Beverly Hillbillies. Jethro, did he wander in there and say, oh, looks like God's looking for someone to take out of you. I'm the man for the job. Step aside, everybody. Here's all my credentials. I'm here to take over the congregation. Lift myself up. No. God exalted him in due time. It says there, uh, uh, where, why lift yourselves above the congregation? Verse 4, and Moses, when he heard it, he fell upon his face. He didn't sit there and make his case. Well, let me tell you why I lift myself above the congregation, because I'm better than you. No, the humility, he just falls upon his face. And, spake unto, and, and he spake to, unto Korah and all his company, saying, even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who are his holy. You know what I love about being right? is that you're right. <laughs> it's so much easier when you know you're right. And Moses here, he knew he was right. And he knew he could just say, hey, well, you want to find out? Let's find out. Let's get, let's get everybody together tomorrow and we'll see who is holy and we'll cause him to come near unto him. 
Even him whom he hath chosen, will he cause to come near unto him. He said, okay, Korah, all right, Dathan, maybe you're right. Maybe I'm not the man for the job. Maybe you are. Let's find out. Let's see what God has to say about it. Let's go to, let's go to God and find out who's really qualified and who isn't. Not to lift himself up because, you know, obviously he's been challenged at this point. <clears throat> so he says here, uh, This do take you censers, Korah, and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose shall be holy. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. And Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray you, ye sons of Levi. Seemeth it but a small thing unto you that God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister to him? He's saying, look, don't you feel important enough just being a son of Levi who gets to come into the tabernacle? And, and you know, maybe you're not going to be son of Aaron you know, who's going into the holy place every year. But isn't it enough for you to just take the ashes out? Isn't it enough for you to just slaughter the animal and throw it on the altar? God's even let you boil some meat and you can eat it. Is it enough to just do, take down the, t the tabernacle and put it up when it's needed? Is it enough for you to just do the menial tasks? Because not everybody even gets to do that. And he's saying, isn't that enough for you? Nope. Look at people who, the, when the wrong people get the spotlight, all they want is more. When wrong people are given responsibility, all they want is more. They want it all. Because they want it all to be about them and not God. <clears throat> and he says here, uh, he says in verse 10, And he hath brought thee near also, and thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee, and seek ye the priesthood also. It wasn't enough for them to just do the service in the tabernacle. They had to be the priest. You know, proud men just can't stand it when somebody else is in charge. They really can't. And look, I'm not in charge of anybody's life here. I'm not. I'm not going to come to you. I'm, you're not ever going to find me out in your front yard looking in your house, peeking over your fence, trying to catch you off guard, knocking on your door. What's going on in there? Come in and say, get rid of this, get rid of that, get this in here, do this. I'm not going to come boss you around. That'd be weird. And if I ever do that, you should probably go because you're, you're about this close to a cult. But I'll tell you where I am in charge, right here, in this house, in this building, and what goes on in, in this place because somebody has to be in charge. Otherwise, we won't get anything done. And, you know, the, the long, I haven't been at it very long, but I'm telling you, after what I've been through this last week, I can tell you this right now, I ain't doing this for my health. And I'm not doing it for my wife's health. You know, and, and, and I can look at Pastor Anderson and say, he certainly isn't doing it for his health. He's doing it for all the right reasons. But proud men, they just can't stand somebody else being in charge. They have to be the ones in charge. You know, I'm in charge here in this building today as the deacon here. And pastor has said, do what you need to do down there. Make the decisions you need to make because you're the one who's got to live with it. That's what he told me. Whoever you, whoever's got to come and go, you just decide. And, and that's it. <coughs> but what was I gonna, where was I going with that? Well, here, oh, yeah. So I'm in charge, right? Amen. But <laughs> <laughs> well, that, was, that was awkward. No. <laughs> but here's the thing. Was I always in charge? You think I've just been in charge of something my whole Christian life? I mean, I, when, I, when I got married, I was in charge. My home. Still am today. But do you think maybe, just maybe, I sat in another church where somebody else was in charge? Oh, yeah. I did that for a lot longer than being in charge. Do you think I ever had a man of God come to me and rip my face and tell me to fix this? And look, there is a certain point. You know, I, like I said, I'm not going to follow people around. But when something comes to light and it has to be dealt with, I'm going to deal with it, whether it's privately or whatever, whatever way it needs to be dealt with. And I've had that happen to me plenty of times. And you know what? If I'd been proud, and I'm not trying to say I'm the, you know, I didn't write the book, The World's Three Most Humble Men and How I Met the Other Two. I'm just saying I had at least, a, a, at least enough absence of pride, I should say, at least enough humility to take it. And there's been plenty of times where I got my face ripped from the pulpit Nobody else knew who the pastor was preaching to, but he and I had had a conversation, and I knew who he was preaching to, and he knew who he was preaching to. And if, you know, if one person's guilty, probably five other people are. If one person needs it, they probably several other people do too. It's usually how it works. And I sat there, and I've had my face ripped, and I've gotten up 
red face and grabbed the family, walked out the door and just all the way home, huffing and puffing. But you know what? The more I thought about it, the more I thought about it and cooled down, I said, he's right. And he said, rather just get proud and go back and show him who's boss. You're not the boss of me. I'm just going to get right with God. I'm just going to repent. I'm just going to, I'm just going to realize that the reason why he did that is to help me. Because that's the pastor's job. And that's, that's the job description of, of the preacher. To reprove, to rebuke, to exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I'm not your therapist. I'm not your marriage counselor. I mean, if you need help and advice, I'll do what I can. But that's not my job description. I'm not your psychoanalysis. I'm not your psychologist. My job is to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering doctrine and to do the work of evangelists. That's what I'm here. To preach the whole counsel of the word of God. That's my job. So if it falls outside of that, you know, it's somebody. Uh, there's experts for that. This is where I. This is what I need to be an expert in, right here. This is my expertise. I don't know where I'm going with any of that, but hopefully that made a point <laughs> that we can use this morning. But proud men, they can't stand somebody being in charge, of being in somebody else's or somebody else's authority. I mean, try that on the job. When your boss tells you to do something, you're not, pff, you're not the boss of me. You're going to be looking for another job real quick. But it's just weird. Like It's just the weirdest thing. People understand that on the job site, but then they bring that, they come to the church and they think it's just, it's different. Like that doesn't, like all of a sudden, it's all bets are off. Nobody's in charge. They're real good about, you know, picking up after themselves at home, but when we're at church, it's just, pff, 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 pff. I'm not saying we have that problem down here. And yeah, I'm getting a little stuff, some stuff off my chest this morning. And I'm glad to do it. And that's just human nature. You know, kids are going to climb up on the, on the sink in the bathroom. And, but that's, you know, people get mad. But that's what you do when you have a family integrated church. You got to take the good and the bad with it. Because it's worth it. But proud man, they can't stand when someone's in charge. So what do they do? They become contentious like Korah here. And I know I got to hurry up. So what happens to Korah, right? They take their censers. They bring their offering. And, and of course, we know the story in verse 18. And they took every man a censer and put fire in them and laid incense thereon and stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation of Moses with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. And they, and they fell upon their faces. So this is another time God, this has happened twice with Moses. He's like, I'm just going to start over with you. And Moses is like, it's about time you recognize my superior qualities. <laughs> no, he falls upon his face because he's in it for the right reasons. He cares about those people. And he said, he falls upon his face and says, oh God, the spirit of all flesh, shall one man sin and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? Proud men, you know, they become, they can't stand someone else being in charge. They become contentious and they don't care who they take down with them. They don't care. Because they're going down, and, and rather than you know, suffer the shame alone, they're willing to just grab whoever. They're like a drowning man. First person gets near, and they're just going to take him right down with them. You know, and the man of God here, he spares others from the fate of the proud. He says, you know, he's saying, look, don't take them all out, Lord. Verse 23, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from the tabernacles of Korah, Adathan, and Abiram. Separate from these people, these wicked people. <laughs> and that's the, you know, let's apply that. Stay away from wicked people or suffer the same fate. And people, a lot of times, they're not even that necessarily that bad or wicked. But, you know, the, the neighbors of Korah, Adathan, and Abiram, they, you know, they spent time with them. They were over there at their, uh, Korah's house. They were over at Dathan's house. Their kids knew their kids. You know, and they and then this happens, and then they and this happens in churches. People get together, they get make friends with people, and then it turns out that friend you made is bad. And I don't mean bad, but I mean they're bad. <coughs> turns out they're bad, and rather then they have, then they're in the spot of well, who am I going to side with? Where does your loyalty lie? With your friend, who's being found out to be a wicked person. Look, nobody goes, let me find somebody who's wicked and make friends with them. 
Because wicked people just don't walk around with, with wicked tattooed on their fo I mean, there's probably people out there with that, but, <laughs> you know, no limits. <laughs> but they don't advertise the fact that they're Korah and Dathan and Abiram. They don't say, hey, we're wicked. We're here to cause harm. We're going we're gonna to drag you down with us if we can. They don't do that. They're nice. They're friendly. They're sweet. They'll bring you over. They'll feed you. They'll talk nice to you. They'll do extra things. Look, and I, I've, I've heard it said over and over again, the, ba the bad people, if you start, when bad people are found out and you look back, you can just see the flattery. Just the bringing of gifts. Always br I'm not saying it's wrong to bring something. But it's just like they're always bringing stuff. They're always just treating you. They're, they're flattering you. They're trying to win you over. And proud men, they take others down with them. So stay away from wicked people or suffer the same fate. You say, separate yourselves from them. And anybody that doesn't, whether they're good or bad, they're going to go down with them. It says in verse 25, And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. And I'm sure Korah and Dathan and Abiram are like, Where are you going? No, stay. Stay with us. We don't want to be the only ones that look bad. And you know what? You're going to go down with them if, you're gonna, if you get talked into that when wicked people are found out. And it's a sad story. It says in verse 27, So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah and Dathan and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents and their wives and their sons and their little children. And it says little children to emphasize the fact that this is a sad story. Because let me tell you something. Little children can't express consent. They can't separate and say, my father. They don't have the discernment. You think a little child knows that every a little child just knows that dad's wicked and wrong? I mean, maybe. There's, I'm sure there's an exception to every rule. But these little kids, you know, they're just, Cora, Dathan, and, Adad, and Abiram, they're just daddy. That's all they are to them. They're just little kids. But you know what? They go down the pit just like everybody else in the story. Because men can destroy their own families. You say, why is this horrible story in the Bible? To warn us, to warn the rest of us, that one man, through his own actions, can destroy his whole family. <clears throat> and it says in verse 28, Moses, hereby you shall know the Lord has sent me to do. Well, we know the story, right? Everyone knows what happens here. The earth opens up underneath they fit their feet and they all go down live into the pit. And if you go back to Joshua chapter 7, you know, that's the same example in our text. God gives this warning over and over and over in Scripture. We saw it here with Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, that when one person gets out of sorts with, with, the, with the Lord, or, you know, for whatever reason, if it's their pride, their ambition, their vainglory, their, whatever it is, they can destroy, it can get to the point where they just destroy their whole family, take every, people that are even innocent, little kids that had nothing to do with it, just go down with them. They suffer the same consequences. Look at Joshua 7, verse 24. And Joshua and all Israel took him and Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver garment and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his ass and his sheep and his tent, everything, all of it, including his children. And they stone them all. And then they burn them. And then they put stones on them so everybody would know what happened. And take heed. These things are written for our admonition unto whom the world, the ends of the world are come. That's why this story is here. Not just so you can try to figure out is God a good guy or a bad guy, but so that you can understand that when you know, God wants things done a certain way and when we get out of sorts with God, there's consequences. So, and sometimes severe consequences. And our own sins, especially us as fathers, as men, can destroy our whole family. One wrong decision, one wrong move, one bad attitude, one bad day can just destroy everything. You know, these stories are examples. They're here to serve as a warning. You know, God's not, you know, just trying to beat his chest here in these stories. Like, look how bad I am. I'll, th I'll just destroy them all. He's trying to warn us. <clears throat> And I'll have you go back. I should have had to keep something in numbers, but go back to number 16. I apologize. Number 16. 
They serve as examples. You know what I love about, well, I don't, there's not really a whole lot to love about the story other than it's good admonition. But one thing I should say that's worth noting is that they serve as example even at that time, like especially. And that's probably pretty fresh, right, to those people. Did you hear what happened to Korah, Dathan, and Abiram? Look at verse 36. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Eleazar, the son of the priest, Aaron, the son of the priest, that he take up the censers out of the burning, and scatter thou the fire yonder, for they are hollowed. So he's saying, look, after he, fire comes out from the Lord and just consumes these guys, because that's what happened in that story. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, or, uh, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the pit swallowed them, but there was this fire that came out and just consumes everybody. And he says, take up the censers out of the burning, right? And scatter thou the fire yonder, for they are hollowed. So they have these censers in their hand. They go and get them out of the ashes. The censers of these sinners against their own souls. Let them make broad plates for a covering. Look what God's doing here. A covering for the altar. For they offered before the, before them before the Lord. Therefore they are hollowed, and they shall be a sign unto the children of Israel. And Eleazar took, the priest took the brazen censers wherewith that, uh, they that burned had offered and they made broad plates for a covering of the altar to be memorial unto the children of Israel <laughs> that no stranger which is not of the seed of Aaron come near to offer incense before the Lord that he be not as Korah and as his company as the Lord said to him by the hands of Moses. But, excuse me, by, yeah, by the hand of Moses. So he says, take the censers that they had that they offered in Take them out of the fire, out of the ash, and make broad plates and put them on the altar. Now, where was the altar? It was if you were walk, if you were going to sacrifice, you could see the altar. It was right there. You know, you'd bring your animal, they'd sacrifice it, and you watch them just throw that thing up. And so now, when you go to that altar and you look at it, you see these broad plates, and you go, "Oh, that's Korah and Dathan and Abiram's plates. I remember that story." He said, "Put it on there, so these people be not as Korah." Everyone who came to make a sacrifice, they would see those censers on the altar. And they'd take warning. Just like in our story back about in the, the Valley of Achor. He said, he said, look, stone them, burn them, and then pile stones upon everything. And then they call it, and then they call it the Valley of Achor unto this day. They, they name it, just like those broad plates, to serve as a reminder. You know, where, how do I get there? Well, you're going to go down, then you're going to take a left at the Valley of Achor. Like, oh yeah, I remember that. The Valley of Acor. Over there is the Valley of Acor. Why do you call it that? And then, well, let me tell you why we call it that. And it's a warning. And what's the warning? What is the Valley of Acor? It's named after a man that failed his family. That's what it's named after. A man who, because of his own covetousness, failed his family. And a man who just destroyed everything with one bad decision. And that serves as a warning to them and to us today. <clears throat> the Bible says in Colossians 2, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility. Let no man beguile you of your reward. You know, God wants to reward us, but if we're not careful, somebody else might just come along and beguile us of it. And if we get too close to these Korahs and too close to these Dathans and Abirams, you know, we might, we might be beguiled out of our reward. We might end up you know, having a valley named after us. So, you know, Achan, he fought with Israel. You know the story. He came over. He was there when Jericho fell. He could have gone right on living his life and saw Ai come down and fought the seven kings and so on and so forth, got himself an inheritance and had a good life and served God. He could have had that. It was his to have. And he fought with Israel, but was, it was his greed that destroyed his family. But he destroyed his family. And you say, well, what was, what was Korah's children's only mistake? They were just born in the wrong house. So don't let all your wor works just get burned and buried and forgotten by allowing yourself to be beguiled by some evil person. And don't lead your families down into the valley of Achor. Let's go ahead and pray.